Hi guys, this is IGCSC O level chemistry paper 22, March 2017. Question 1. A gas is released at point Q in the apparatus shown. Okay, which gas changes the color of damp universal indicator paper most quickly? So the gas that are released are ammonia, carbon dioxide, chlorine, and hydrogen, which have an MR of 17, 44, 71, and 2. So the gas that would quickly reach the damp universal indicator paper would be hydrogen gas with the lowest MR. However, hydrogen does not change the color of the universal indicator paper, whereas ammonia, carbon dioxide, and chlorine will change the color. So between these three gases, the one with the lowest MR is ammonia, having an MR of 17, which is the lowest MR. So it will reach the damp indicator. Uh, universal indicator paper and turn it from green to purple or blue because it is a basic gas. So the correct option for this question is option A. Question 2. The diagrams show liquids in a burette and a measuring cylinder. Which row shows the correct readings for the burette and the measuring cylinder? So for the burette, if we have a reading of 28 and then uh, 0 0.1 less than 28 is 27.9 and then a reading below that is 27.8. So the reading on the burette scale would be 27.8. Whereas in the measuring cylinder, we have a reading of 40, then 42 and then 44. So this is a reading of 44. Since every graduation represents 2 cm3, whereas on the burette, every graduation represents 0 0.1 cm3. So, which rows show uh, the correct readings? So, the burette scale reads 27.8, eliminating options C and D. And the measuring cylinder scale reads 44, eliminating option A and making option B the correct option for this question. Question three, the diagram shows how muddy water can be purified. So it is passed through fine sand, then gravel, then small pebbles, and then we get clean water. Which process of purifying muddy water is shown? So this is basically water being filtered using different uh, forms of the filtering material in this case. Fine sand filters out smaller particles. Gravel filters out, out medium particles. And small pebble filters out large particles. So it's not crystallization. It is not distillation. And it is not solvent extraction. The process is called filtration. And this makes option C the correct option for this question. Question four. Which statement explains why isotopes of an element have the same chemical properties? This is because they have the same number of electrons in their outermost shells. Because chemical properties are based on the transfer or the sharing of electrons. So since they have the same number of electrons, they would have the same chemical properties. So the options are they have different number of neutrons. This is not the reason why they have the same chemical properties. They have the same number of electrons and protons. This is not the reason why they have same chemical properties because they have included the term protons here along with electrons. They have the same number of electrons in the outer shell exactly. This is why they have the same chemical properties. They have the same number of protons in the nucleus, not a reason for having same chemical properties. Therefore, option C is the correct option for this question. Question five. The formula of some ions are shown. In which row is the formula not correct? Aluminum sulfate. So Al has a three positive charge and sulfate has a two negative charge. So aluminum sulfate would be Al2O3. Uh, not O3, SO3. SO4 taken thrice. Al2, SO4 taken thrice. This is the formula of aluminum sulfate. Next is calcium nitrate. Ca has a two positive charge, nitrate has a negative one charge, so it will become CaNO3 twice. Next is iron 3 bromide. Iron 3 has a three plus charge, so Fe and bromide is a negative one charge, so Br3, FeBr3. And the final one is potassium sulfide. 
potassium has a charge of plus one and sulfide has a charge of minus two. So this will become K2S. So Al2SO4 taken thrice is correct. CaNO3 twice is correct. Fe3Br is incorrect. K2S is correct. So this makes option C the correct option for this question. Question six, diamond and silicon for oxide both have giant structures. Which statements are correct? Both substances are compounds. No, silicon for oxide is a compound, but diamond is just made up of carbon. It is an allotrope of an element carbon. So one is incorrect. There are strong covalent bonds in diamond. Yes, all carbon atoms are bonded to four other carbon atoms via covalent bonding. Silicon for oxide is bonded ionically. No, it is also a covalent compound. Both substances have very high melting points. Yes, both are giant covalent macromolecules. Both of them have very high melting points. So since statements two and four are correct, option C is the correct option for this question. Question seven, which statements about metals is correct? Layers of positive ions can slide over each other, making metals malleable. Yes, this is correct for metals because that is the reason why they are malleable. That means they can be drawn into shapes. Metallic bonding consists of lattice of negative ions in a sea of delocalized electrons, a lattice of positive ions. Metal metallic bonding consists of a lattice of positive ions in a sea of delocalized negative ions. No, in a sea of delocalized electrons. Metals conduct electricity because positive ions are free to move. No, electrons are free to move. So this makes option A the correct option for this question. Question 8. The gas hydrazine has the molecular formula N2H4. Hydrazine burns in air to form nitrogen gas and steam. Which statements are correct? One mole of hydrazine. Gives 72 dm cube of gas, gaseous products when it reacts with oxygen at room temperature and pressure. So the molar ratio are 1 is to 1 is to 1 is to 2. So the gaseous products are 3 moles. So 3 into 24 is equal to 72 dm cube. So this statement is correct. Next, the empirical formula of hydrazine is NH2. Since the molecular formula is N2H4, the empirical formula is N2H4 divided by 2 is NH2. So this statement is correct as well. 3. The total number of atoms in 1 mole of hydrogen is 6 into the Avogadro's constant. So there are 2 moles of nitrogen atoms and 4 moles of hydrogen atoms. Altogether 6 moles. So the number of atoms would be 6 multiplied by the Avogadro's constant. So this is correct as well. And lastly, the volume of 1 mole of hydrogen at room temperature and pressure is equal to 6 into 24 dm cube. No. It will just be 24 dm cube because there is one mole of hydrazine gas present. So statement 4 is incorrect. Since statements 1, 2 and 3 are correct, option A is the correct option for this question. Question 9. Copper 2 carbonate is broken down by heating to form copper 2 oxide and carbon dioxide. The equation for the reaction is shown. 31 grams of copper to carbonate are heated until all of the contents of the test tube have turned from green to black. The yield of copper to oxide is 17.5. What is the percentage yield? So the MR of copper carbonate is 123.5 and the MR of copper oxide is 79.5. So 123.5 produces 79.5 grams of CuO. Therefore, 31 grams would produce how much? So this would be 31 divided by 123.5 multiplied by 79.5. This gives us a value of 19.96 grams. So now we need to find out the percentage yield. So out of this 19.96, we are left with 17.5 grams. So 17.5 divided by 19.96 multiplied by 100 gives us a value of 87 point almost five zero it is not exactly five zero but we don't have any other options closely matching this so 87.50 percent 
And since this value is present in option D, option D is the correct option for this question. Question 10. The diagram shows the electrolysis of aqueous copper to sulfate. And we have carbon electrodes. Which statement is correct? Copper metal is deposited at the positive electrode? No. Copper metal is deposited at the negative electrode because copper ions are reduced to copper metal and reduction takes place at the cathode, which is the negative electrode. In the external circuit, electrons move from positive to negative. Well, the movement of electrons are from the anode towards the cathode. So anode is where oxidation is taking place. So the positive electrode is the anode. So in the external circuit, electrons are move, electrons move from positive to negative. So direction of electron flow would be if this is the anode, the positive terminal, then electrons flow away from this. So this is correct. In the external circuit, electrons move from positive to negative. Okay. And uh, the next one is in the solution, the electrons move from negative to positive. In the solution, the electrons do not move. Solutions has movement of ions, not electrons. And oxygen gas is produced at the anode. So anode is where oxidation occurs. So we've got, this is uh, copper to sulfate. So sulfate ions are there. Sulfate uh, would be not just discharged in comparison to the hydroxide ions from water, which would be converted into oxygen gas. So oxygen gas is produced at the positive electrode. Okay, so since we've got two correct options, that means we are not looking at something closely. So let's revisit the correct options. In B, it says in the external circuit, the electrons move from positive to negative. And in D, it says oxygen gas is produced at the positive electrode. So D is 100% correct. Oxygen gas is produced at the positive electrode and copper metal is deposited at the negative electrode. So this is 100% correct. So looking at option B one more time, in the external circuit, electrons move from positive to negative. So we can see that electrons are moving from the positive terminal and electrons are moving towards the negative terminal. What we have in between the negative and positive terminal is the battery. So the electrons do not directly move from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. The electrons go to the battery and electrons from the battery would flow towards the negative terminal. So we do not have a direct flow of electrons. We have an interfering piece of apparatus in between, which is the cell. And because of which we can say that option B is incorrect. And this would make option D the correct option for this question.